Hello, everyone. Uh, so thank you again for coming to the uh, sports conference this year. Uh, to introduce I'm my name, myself, my name is Mike McMillan. I'm the logistics lead for this year's conference. I'm happy to introduce uh, the privacy and data security, avoiding legal pitfalls of analytics uh, competitive advantage, which will be presented by Heather Sussman, who's a partner at Ropes and Gray uh, in charge of the privacy and data security practice. So uh, with that, I'd like to hand it off to Heather to uh, begin the CA. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks. I love that the lawyers really bring out the crowds. It's like, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna try and make it not too legalistic and too boring, but um, we took a, about an hour presentation and compressed it down to a 30 minute time timeline, so I'm gonna talk quickly. I also just got off a red eye flight coming back from a conference in Palo Alto, so, uh, you know, when you factor in fatigue and caffeine and a compressed time frame, you're just gonna have to strap on your seatbelt. We'll try to go as quick as we can. So. Today we're talking about privacy and data security in particular in the analytics context, but in order to do that, I wanna first really lay a foundation so that we're all on the same page, understanding the legal landscape. My goal today is to help you think about privacy and data security in terms of a framework, so that to the extent that you're evaluating analytics programs going forward and you wanna think, hmm, does this violate privacy laws? Should we be concerned about data security laws? Hopefully this talk today is going to give you some framework for making that analysis. So basic terminology just to level set, and I'm gonna come back to some of this terminology as we're talking throughout the day. You've got personal data. Personal data is any data that can be used to identify a natural living person. We call those data subjects. Now the MBA talk that I heard earlier today about managing schedules, um, they're talking a lot about crunching numbers that have to do with team schedules. That's not personal data, right? But if you start to layer in metrics about player performance and you wanna see how that might impact or determine a schedule change, individual player performance statistics would be personal data and so that is something that's going to trigger privacy and data security laws. So not personal data, keeps it outside the realm of privacy and data security laws. If it is personal data, pulls it within. A data controller. This is terminology that we use to think about the data owner. It's the hat that I wear when I am the owner of the data and I'm gonna decide who's gonna process that data, who I'm gonna send it to, how I'm gonna use it, and whether to collect it at all. Processing. Processing personal data means you're just performing a set of operations. And I'm, I, I use that shorthand to mean you know, collection, use, disclosure, disposal. Um, that's the processing of personal data. And then a data processor. These are data-related vendors, someone that you might hire to come in and help you with performing certain analytics functions. If they have access with a capital A, I call it, access with a capital A, so they either have access to the data, access to your network, access to your physical premises where they could get their hands on that personal data, we think of them as a data-related vendor. We typically call them, under privacy laws, a data processor. So privacy versus security, I get this a lot. There seems to be great confusion. Someone says privacy when they mean data security. Someone says security when they mean privacy. Privacy really deals with the concept of does the entity, does that data controller have the right to collect and process that information in the first place? So that's privacy. Security means, well, regardless of whether you have the right to collect that data, do you, how do you safeguard it? How do you keep it secure and protect it from a, from a breach, for example? Um, you know, a great example in this concept of you can have security without privacy, but you can't have privacy without security. I can't keep data private unless I keep it secure. But I could wrap data with tons of security but not have had the right to process that data in the first place. So that would be a breach of a privacy law, but I would have great security um, protecting that, that data. So this is the realm now of the why should you care, level set. Let's jump to this map and what I wanna show you is the proliferation of privacy and data protection laws around the world. The red and the blue countries are a little less relevant for our talk today, but what these show is every one of these color-coded countries has a privacy law on the books. The blue countries are laws that focus, they take a, what we call a sectoral approach. They focus on industries, they focus on type of data. We here in the United States seem hyper-focused on protecting things like payment card data, social security numbers, healthcare data, financial data. Whereas the red countries are what we call an omnibus jurisdiction. 
they have laws that protect personal data generally, regardless of the business of the entity, regardless of the way that that data is collected, um, just generally protecting data as personal data and treating privacy as a fundamental human right. I also want to point out the proliferation of data breach notification laws around the world. So right now in all the green countries that you see, and remarkably, the United States, this is one area we seem to excel at, is having data breach notification laws on the books. But increasingly, more and more green countries are popping up around the world. These data breach notification laws require companies not only to protect the personal data they may be collecting, but also to notify individuals to the extent that there's been a data breach involving that information. And there are often penalties that are attached to a violation of those laws. It can be up to substantial penalties. Europe, for example, we see uh, is not presently very green, but there's a new law coming out called the General Data Protection Regulation. There'll be a two-year runway ramp up to comply. That has a general data breach notification requirement. Actually, it's gonna require companies to notify regulators of a data breach within 48 hours. That's the shortest time frame around the world, faster than anything we have in the United States. But what's really interesting is that general data protection regulation, to the extent that you are involved in the field of analytics, treats profiling and analytics with significant scrutiny. And so if you are collecting personal data about EU citizens, or you're going to be conducting operations or targeting customers or consumers anywhere in Europe, be mindful of this general data protection regulation coming into force in two years. It's going to take a while to comply or to put in place the, the structures that you'll need in order to comply. So let's talk now um, a little bit. I mentioned the data breach notification laws, and this is all under the same rubric of why should you care about personal data. Well, data breaches are a pervasive problem. Since 2005, we see 4,786 U.S. publicly announced data security breaches. And again, I'm just gonna focus on the U.S. for now. We saw the data breach map that's where we have the most significant laws in this space presently. But the vast majority of reported breaches attacked personal data. These are either, um, the goal is for the attacker to monetize that data, stealing social security numbers, filing false tax returns and the like, but there's also hacktivists. We saw this in the case of the Ashley Madison hack from earlier in the year. All types of personal data are typically reported attacked or lost. It's really social security numbers, financial account information, Emails, login account information, this is a substantial problem we're seeing right now with phishing attacks, emails that come in trying to trick employees within the organization to give out their email credentials. And then once the attackers have those email credentials, they're surfing around inside of the email accounts trying to find additional information to further attack the company and get more data. Of course, most breaches are never publicly reported and how many simply go undetected. This just puts into perspective a visual about some of the biggest breaches that we've had in modern history. You can see number of records impacted by the breach. We're talking hundreds of millions of records. Now some of these are the focus of the attacker was getting payment card information, but others aren't just payment card information. Sometimes the attacker's goal is to get at certain data that will allow them to build a profile to engage in further social engineering to attempt to um, find further vulnerabilities to get it even more valuable data. And of course, data breaches just result in enormous costs. There's some statistical information up here about recent studies. The cost per record is substantial. So if you have a data breach involving 100 million individuals, that cost of, of defending and cleaning up that breach can be substantial. And of course, you've got the issue of legal exposure, right? It's not just the financial impact, but also defending litigation, defending uh, regulatory enforcement action. And so who are the regulators in, in this space? Well, I had a whole series of slides that talk, get into the nitty gritty about the, the legal claims that could be advanced in this space, but unless you're a total legal nerd like I am in the privacy space, not gonna be of interest to you. If you want those slides, let me know afterwards and I'll be happy to send them to you. Um, but I think the point here is that the primary regulator in this space is the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. You've got state attorneys general. You also have self-regulatory frameworks, which we're going to touch on today because it impacts 
the analytics world um, when it comes to online tracking and interest-based advertising. But then, of course, also private litigation. So I'm going to just skip quickly through on the regulatory enforcement. Um, I, this is relevant, though, because it sets the stage for a discussion that we're going to have when we talk about the fair information practice principles, that framework that I mentioned at the beginning for trying to how to evaluate how to avoid privacy and data security breaches. A theory of liability for a breached entity, um, it's that the Federal Trade Commission enforces the Federal Trade Commission Act, Section 5 of the FTC Act just generally prohibits unfair and deceptive acts or practices. But what this standard basically shows is that you can face, so it generally prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices. You can face an unfairness claim by the Federal Trade Commission and the state attorneys general who have many FTC acts and will often um, make the same types of claims that the Federal Trade Commission will. The unfairness claim you can have if you have lax security and that caused or is likely to cause this substantial consumer injury. You can face a deception claim if you made a representation, a misrepresentation, or a material omission, and it wasn't true, right? So you made a statement in your online privacy policy that says, we are going to protect this data. Give us your consumer data. We will protect it. You suffer a breach. That could serve as the basis for a deception claim. You promised consumers you were going to protect their data, and you failed to do it. It led to a data breach. Um, can lead to a deception claim. The exposure from the Federal Trade Commission uh, FTC cases are can result in investigation, ultimately a cease and desist order. You've got ancillary affirmative injunctive relief and disgorgement or restitution um, to take away any profits you may have gained from the unlawful actions. There are no penalties, though, that the Federal Trade Commission can't issue fines and penalties. Um, and so typically what happens is they'll enter into a consent decree with a, an offending company, but the consent decrees can last for 20 years. And then fines and penalties come when an entity who's under a 20-year enforcement uh, a settlement agreement then violates the terms of that settlement agreement. And some of these settlement agreements contain really broad statements like, you will comply with the law. So you will comply with the law, so then you have a legal violation, violate the law, which some entities can do in a vast stretch of 20 years. That's then what can be the hook to lead to um, fines and penalties. Now, it's different under the state attorney's general model because those uh, mini FTC acts that I mentioned, a similar un uh, prohibition on unfair deceptive acts or practices, um, very similar legal analysis to the Federal Trade Commission Act. But on those cases, you will see the legal exposure can, in fact, lead not just to injunctive relief, consumer restitution, but also to civil penalties. And the penalties can be substantial. So you can face both a federal enforcement action for violation of privacy and data security laws, but also state attorneys general enforcement action as well. I mentioned just briefly the uh, litigation exposure, the potential for litigation exposure. But the one thing that I want to really resonate with this group here is that in many cases, it's not just the, the fear of litigation that's going to be de driving decision making in the privacy and data security realm. It's this issue of consumer trust. And so, yes, I can put up a slide that talks about the, the risks, the cost of litigation, but I was on a panel yesterday or listening to a panel, Rob Sherman, who is the Deputy Chief Privacy Officer for Facebook, says, consumer trust in this privacy space comes down to this. When people trust Facebook and they feel that they're being treated fairly, then they're going to use Facebook more. If people don't trust Facebook and they feel like their data is being misused, they will use Facebook less. Very simple way of distilling down this concept of how important consumer trust can be and establishing privacy and data security trust with consumers can lead to greater consumer engagement, better flexibility on how to use the data, and ultimately help to bring together the many of the analytic strategies that we see in the sports industry today. Okay, so we've got 
risk of a data security breach. You've got the potential regulatory enforcement action, the cost and expense of litigation, and the potential for harming consumer trust if you don't respect privacy and data security laws. What is a company to do? Let's talk a little bit about to put concepts into action for the, the next series of slides that I want to run through with you. And that is to really understand what is a security breach versus what is a privacy breach. So a security breach is unauthorized access or acquisition to personal data. This is the classic hack, stolen laptop, you name it. A privacy breach, on the other hand, is when a company might be alleged to have used information in a way that it wasn't permitted to do, either under a privacy policy or under the law, or um, done it inconsistently in terms of a contract. So maybe you enter into a service provider contract where a data broker is going to give you information, and under the terms of that contract, you have agreed that you won't use it in a certain way, and you then do. Um, that's a potential privacy breach as well. The other area where we see privacy breaches happening, which I mentioned, this Federal Trade FTC, the deception claim where you make a statement and then you act in contravention of that statement, um, that's also potentially a, what we would call a privacy breach um, as opposed to necessarily a data security breach. So let's talk about tips for avoiding data security breaches. I'm going to talk at the macro level first. At the macro level, I'll often say, if you want to avoid data security breaches within your organization, you have to focus on your people, your processes, and your technology. So when I mean people, I'm talking about hiring the right people in the first place, conducting background checks, limiting access control so that only people who really have a need to be touching that sensitive data that you have within the organization have the access rights. Shutting off those access rights when those individuals leave the organization, just for example. Conducting effective training. You know, some of the biggest cases that we've seen in the area of uh, inter uh, privacy breaches and data security breaches are this idea of insider threats. So how many of you have heard of Edward Snowden, for example? <laughs> Edward Snowden, insider threat. He worked for a federal contracting agency and used his access to data in order to exfiltrate that data and release it to the media. It has had um, pretty disastrous consequences for American businesses and has impacted them substantially going forward. How many of you have heard of private first class Bradley Manning? Okay, Bradley Manning, not related to Peyton or Eli. Private first class Bradley Manning worked for the military and he came in one day with a CD-ROM, uh, plugged that CD-ROM, the DVD, into the network, the system to which he had access, downloaded hundreds of thousands of classified documents on a DVD that was labeled Lady Gaga, put it in the case, walked out the door, gave those documents to WikiLeaks. Classic example of an insider threat, an otherwise trusted individual who properly has access in connection with the job, but that organization, in that case the military, did not have the right security controls in place, the technology that would notice when an individual is actually downloading massive amounts of very sensitive data onto a DVD. So he may have had the right to access that data in connection with his job, but technology, it's called data loss prevention technology, or DLP, should have detected and alerted someone that that data was being transferred onto portable media, because then you can, natural conclusion is that that portable media is going to walk right out of the building. And it did. Well, let's talk about data security, preventing a data security breach in the analytics context. This is the framework for thinking about how to avoid breaches when it comes to working in analytics. So step number one, you need to understand your data flows. How is the data being collected? Let's use a great example of player performance data from the field. Just one example. Maybe through chips, embedded sensors, in shoes, or in wearable technology. That information, that data is being collected and transmitted somewhere. And so if you follow the data flow of how that data is collected and transmitted, you have to think about, well, what are the potential vulnerabilities? What are the access points? Is it wirelessly transmitted? Is that wireless transmission encrypted? If it's not encrypted, who could hack it? Anyone within line of sight could hack that data. And so how sensitive the data, what's the level of protection you should be offering? To figure that out, the first step is to really understand your data flows. 
I also think it's so important to involve IT or information security, so IT, information technology, IS is information security, involve them early. This is a concept called security by design. Your analytics team has this fabulous new idea for collecting lots of data about visitor, visitors to the stadium who may be walking around the organization and you think, yeah, let's pick up, let's detect on their mobile devices where they're walking. We're gonna collect that data, we're gonna figure out where's the foot traffic moving, match it up to the highest margin kiosks to make sure that we're, from a position standpoint, bringing our um, you know, really putting our high margin products in front of the consumers in the high traffic area. It's a great idea, great product, could have enormous benefits. Involving information security early to help you map those data flows really helps to think through what are the potential risks to that data. Okay, we might be collecting it. Is it individually identifiable? Do we want to try to de-identify that data if we're going to be storing it? So even if we did have a breach, it wouldn't be usable because it wouldn't be traceable back to an individual. Diligence your vendors. Put in place important contractual provisions. So if you're gonna hire an agency to do some of this analytics on your behalf, make sure you have that information security and that privacy rider in the contract with, to, to make clear what their responsibilities are versus yours, particularly in the event of a breach. And then, as I mentioned, consider principles of data minimization. Use encryption and pseudonymization where possible. All right, I'm pretty tired. The fact that I got out pseudonymization on the first try. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of myself. So pseudonymization is this concept where um, uh, anonymization would be you de-identify the data. So you decouple the data from its, who are the individuals, the data subjects about, about whom that data relates, and you throw away the key. So you can never re-correlate. Pseudonymization might be a technique whereby you decouple the data, but you retain the key. So maybe you give your vendors access to pseudonymized data so that when you get the data file back after they've performed their analysis on it, you could re-identify, but it's a way to protect the privacy of that data as it travels into third hands, third party hands. So now let's talk about how to avoid privacy breaches at the macro level. So maybe you have the best security in the world, you're totally confident that you can avoid a privacy breach, how do you, um, a security breach, how do you avoid a privacy breach? Well, I think you have to start with the fair information practice principles. These are the FIPS. I come back to these FIPS all the time in the context of what I'm doing in privacy law. Principle number one, notice and transparency. Yeah, you can collect that data about individuals who may be walking through your stadium and maybe you're using beacons to do that, to monitor from the mobile devices, to get a real good idea of foot traffic, but how are you telling customers, the consumers, the visitors to the stadium that that's what you're doing? You need to think through that. This is a basic privacy principle, the principle of notice, being transparent about what are your data collection practices. Principle number two, giving consumers choice. The ability to opt out, to say, you know what, I don't want my data, I don't want to be tracked as I'm walking around the stadium. How do I have control or choice? Is that even possible? It may not be required by the law, but part of a privacy analysis is actually walking through these privacy principles to figure out whether they do apply. And how can we make sure that the practice that we're undertaking tries to respect these to the best, in the best way that we can. Access. Access is a principle under privacy law which says if you're going to collect consumer data, personal data about individuals, you should give those consumers the ability to get access, to see what kind of data you have about them that you've collected, to give them an opportunity to correct that data, update that data. We see this a lot in the case of of data brokers, Google advertising technology, as if you've ever gone on to Google and take a look at your ad um, preferences, they, they'll show you. If you sign on, you can look and see what are the categories that they've assigned to you. You know, are you an urbanite? Do you have an interest in visiting Los Angeles? And you can toggle on and off what might be your, your preferences so it can, it, you can control the type of ads that you might see through the Google platform. Integrity and security. Security is protecting it, but integrity is making sure that that data is accurate so that it can't be manipulated over time. So these two principles are really uh, closely linked. And then finally, enforcement and redress. So this is the important principle that uh, under the law, not only must entities like the Federal Trade Commission have the ability to come in and investigate and make sure that we're respecting these principles, but also internally within your organization. Who's in charge of privacy and data security? What is the governance model like? Do you have someone who's a CPO, a chief privacy officer, or designated in that role? That's an important um, concept to be able to demonstrate should you ever uh, be alleged to have violated 
a privacy law. So let's take up preventing privacy breaches in the analytics context. Much like I mentioned that data flow map, right? Think about how you're collecting it. You do the same thing in the privacy space. Where's that data coming from and what restrictions might attach to it? Did I buy data from a data-related vendor? Maybe I'm gonna append it to my existing consumer profiles because I wanna learn more about who my consumers are so I can have better consumer engagement. But do the contract that I use to procure that data from that third-party vendor allow me to use the data in that way? Are there any restrictions that attach to that? Being mindful of that and making sure those are respected. Um, if you're collecting data directly from the consumer, making sure that you're posting a privacy policy, right? That's that notice and transparency principle. And include any required elements. There are state laws that require privacy policies to include specific elements, so just being mindful that you're describing your information practices in a, in a transparent way. If you're getting the data from that third party source, check applicable terms. You wanna collect social media data and you know, commingle it with existing data to get a better view of who your consumers are, better consumer engagement, great idea. But many of these social media platforms have terms that restrict the type of data that you can pull off those platforms and how you can use it. So just being mindful of those terms and baking those into your process. The other things to be mindful of for avoiding privacy breaches in the analytics context is that you wanna evaluate how you're going to collect, use, store, and dispose the data. Is the proposed processing even permitted by law? Do the practices fit within your existing privacy policy? Um, these are all practices that you, or questions you can be asking yourself as you're evaluating a particular analytics proposal to figure out how to not run afoul of the privacy and data security laws. I mentioned security by design, this idea of putting the product in place, or putting the, the analytics process in place in a way that considers security from the outset. The sim similar concept applies of privacy by design. So take, undertaking a particular analytics initiative, but doing it in a way that is sensitive to the privacy requirements and the privacy needs, um, and, and certainly the privacy policies that you already have in place. All right, so I wanted to use a real world example to be able to show you potential privacy pitfalls. We talked about um, the world of online tracking. I mentioned that there's a self-regulatory framework for interest-based advertising. So online tracking typically happens through websites, it happens through mobile applications, embedded software, embedded what we call trackers on a site. And I use the word trackers just to refer to a lot of different types of varied technologies that you might find on a particular web page out there in the World Wide Web. You've got cookies, beacons, super cookies have been in the press lately. Um, and, and many other types of technology, beacons and the like. There are great reasons to have those kinds of trackers. You might wanna conduct analytics, measurement of the traffic to your website. Um, there may be some deeper uh, analysis you can do, not just of the traffic to your website, but then where do people go when they leave your site? And what are they doing out there on the web? Um, these tracking technologies can also be used for interest-based advertising, but there is a self-regulatory regulatory framework called the DAA, the Digital Advertising Alliance, and so if you, as a publisher of a website, want to engage in this kind of analytics activity, just need to be mindful of those DAA principles and include appropriate disclosures in your privacy policy. There are different disclosures that you might make for analytics that are conducted through the web versus analytics that are conducted through mobile applications. It's a different type of technology. There are different opt-out methods. Um, and then there are also disclosures you need to make when one app that you might have on a particular device is collecting data from other apps that appear on the device. It's called cross-app data collection analysis and use. And then I just wanna make a special note here about geolocation because anytime your trackers are picking up geolocation data, it is deemed typically to be a more sensitive category of data. And so those FIPS, those Fair App Information Practice Principles that I mentioned, it's really important to keep those in mind uh, when working through the collection of geolocation data. Consider principles of data minimization, anonymization, pseudonymization, to try to figure out how to, how to keep that geolocation data in a way um, that it can respect individual privacy rights. So I wanted to show you an example of online tracking in action. I mentioned the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission actually does. So you go to their website, and when you come to the web page, it actually doesn't look like any tracking is happening through the web page. But I have an analytics tool by my friends at Ghostry who provide this as an enterprise product 
where I can put the URL www.fpc.gov and I can see the kind of tracking that's happening. So these circular balls here are calls that are going out to different entities. It's typically each arrow represents some sort of a tracking technology that's happening on that site, whether it's for analytics or measurement. And so this, the fact that this tracking is happening is invisible to the site. You don't notice it as an ordinary consumer coming to their web page, and it doesn't violate the law. We would expect the FTC to be complying with the law. And the FTC does a terrific job of meeting their disclosure requirements, that notice and transparency principle. You've got here, this, I just did a snapshot of their privacy policy that talks about cookies. This is like a four-page disclosure that even lists all the different cookies and um, how to opt out of those cookies if you can opt out at all. So as I was thinking through, all right, so that's the gold standard, the Federal Trade Commission. I wanted to come up with maybe an industry standard. And so I looked at a few of the participants from, who were even here at this conference. I ran through a few of your websites through the analytics tool. And I thought, okay, I can't name and shame. I'm not gonna put anybody on the wall. Who can I use as an example to show the it, uh, broader analytics data collection happening through the web? And so of course I thought, What's an or I'm gonna be calling an organization out here. What's an organization that's typically calling out professional athletes in a name and shame experience? TMZ, all right? So TMZ, when you take, you come to their website, don't necessarily notice that any tracking's happening here. But if you go onto and run their URL through, you can see the amount of trackers that are happening, okay? These are all individual calls, and it's part of the reason when you come to TMZ.com that the page loads so slowly. This is not a problem. This doesn't violate the law. What the self-regulatory framework says is that you have to put in place disclosures and an opt-out mechanism in your privacy policy, and in fact, TMZ does. It's buried in their privacy policy, but I found it. It's there. Um, and so they did a good job of, of at least calling this out, not to the same degree that the Federal Trade Commission did. But um, for anyone here who might be curious as to whether it's happening on your website, if you're mildly curious or concerned, um, just let me know, because I can also do this for you and send you a snapshot of your own website just to get a sense of what tracking might be happening through there. So just to close, this I think is a really important slide because against the backdrop of the FIFs, if you want to go through the process of trying to evaluate whether and to what extent you may be either complying with the FIFs or trying to be privacy sensitive and adopting an analytics model or practice, ask yourself these questions, because if you can ask these questions and answer them away, this is similar to conducting what we call a privacy impact assessment, and it's a great first step to making sure that you're respecting those fifths and engaging in that analytics in a privacy-sensitive way. Thank you.